in which I, there we go and then i'll mute everybody now and go ahead You want me to wait a minute before I hit the music? Were you going to put up a slide? The there title? it is. Yeah, put that up for a minute or two, and and then, and then start the music. Yeah. Okay. You can just say when whenever you feel moved to do so. Well, how about next week? <laughs> oh, there, okay, so. And you can kill this any, you can tell me to stop at any time you want. Just leave it there while we're listening. We've we've lost the sound. Oh, sorry. Because I'm a moron. I didn't want to be talking over it. That was uh, Tramorai, is that how you say that? By Robert I Schumann? think so. That was Polly Oliver playing the piano. Um, good evening, welcome to the uh, third Wednesday Vesper service, sponsored by the Unitarian Universalist Multiracial Unity Action Council, for short, UUMUAC or UMIAC. I'm uh, Richard Trudeau. I'm a semi-retired minister living in Massachusetts. I'm the chair of UMIAC this year. Our uh, sermon tonight is called Be Ours a Religion by Dr. Matthew Shear. Dr. Shear is a 1980 graduate of the New England College of Optometry and completed a postgraduate program from the Baltimore Academy for Behavioral Optometry in 2002. He has also trained as a peer counselor, eventually teaching the technique to others. His particular interest, this is interesting, his particular interest is in the effects of misperception on our understanding of ourselves and the world and how that affects our behaviors. 
This focus eventually led him from clinical practice to becoming a religious professional. He became, began preaching lay-led services in 2007, and in 2018 was engaged by Channing Church in Rockland, Massachusetts as their full-time preacher, where he served for two years. Today, he'll speak about how these ideas speak to the present situation in Unitarian Universalism. I have some announcements that I want to share. Uh, mostly, our next service, the third Wednesday in October is the 19th. The preacher is the Reverend Dr. Kate Rohde. I'm so pleased that she's agreed to be one of our preachers. Her sermon title is, as you can see there, the L word is liberalism. If uh, you got a Zoom link from that email address, you will automatically get one next month unless you opt out. But if you were forwarded the link by someone else, uh, you may not get it because they may not forward it to you again, in which case you should just send an email to that address and ask to be included on the list. All of our past services are available on YouTube. Go to our our, our website, umiac.org, and, and just scroll down, and eventually it'll, you'll see it says Third Wednesday Services, and there's a, a link there to all of them, including this one, or hopefully to this one. I'm going to light a chalice and then turn the short service over to Matt. We gather this hour as people of faith, having sorrows and joys and needs and gifts. We light this beacon of hope as a sign of our quest for truth and meaning and in celebration of the life we share together. You're on, Matt. Okie dokie. Uh, our opening hymn is uh, number, uh, I, actually, excuse me. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to address you in this forum. And I do invite you to stay muted, but join me as you are will, John and I actually, uh, as you're willing and able in singing hymn number 1058, Be Ours a Religion. Um, the, the words will appear on your screen, and this is an arrangement I worked out with Joan, who has become my life partner and also co-hosting and also my singing partner, and she is doing host duty on this broadcast. So with that as an introduction, let's see if I can actually bring this puppy home here. Pages? Nope, nope, sorry. I lost it. There it is. Okay, share. And hit it. Hit it. We are a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Be its temple, all space, its shrine, the good heart, its creed. goes through a solo will come back with beautiful harmonies.
Okay. Richard, are you going to talk about the mission and vision of vision of UMIAC? Yes. It is the mission of the Unitarian Universalist Multiracial Unity Action Council to carry out and foster anti-racist and multiracial unity activities both within and outside the Unitarian Universalist Association through education, bearing witness and other actions and expansion of our membership both within and outside the walls of our congregations. We also seek to defend our UU principles against those who seek to undermine them. We envision our congregations, denomination, and society as not being color blind, but color appreciative, as judging and treating members of the world's rank and file by the content of their character, not the color of their skin or their cultural heritage, and as treasuring diversity in the context of the beloved community. We call this vision multiracial Unitarian Universalism. This is the mountaintop. This is the prize on which we want to keep our eyes. This is the goal, the unity of the light and dark-skinned people of the world. Again, I guess I'm back. Hi. I, I, this is a prayer that I, I wrote uh, a year ago. It just kind of came out of me out of, the no, out of nowhere out, while I was thinking about things. <clears throat> when the winds of change blow strong, when the tides of change are rising, may we have the strength to greet the winds of change with stony resolve when they would threaten to blow us over. May our walls be sturdy enough to give us shelter from the storm. But may we also have the ability to soar on winds of change that blow us away. May we be buoyant and be able to swim on rising tides of change that carry us away from walls that can no longer protect us. And may our strength and our walls give strength and shelter to others when winds and tides of change bring them to our door. And may we find strength and shelter from others when winds and tides of change bring us to theirs. Amen. And now let us be silent together to create an opportunity for prayer or meditation. Okay, and we're back. Um, now, please remain muted, but sing as you will, Spirit of Life. If you need the number, of course, it's hymn number one, two, three. Let's see how quickly I can screen share this time. And let's roll. Come unto me, sing in my heart, all the sins of compassion, all in the wind, eyes in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. 
Okay. I'd like to offer this reading as it, as it were. Um, it, it comes from a book called Search by Michelle Hunovan. It's her newer book. She's a regional author out of Southern California. Um, I would just tell you, I've never stopped reading, thinking, and writing since losing that pulpit at Channing Church at the start of the COVID pandemic. But what's made me happiest over the past two years of unchosen sabbatical was the freedom to, or choose your preferred metaphor, follow either my muse or my nose for news. And so it was that despite this date drawing ever closer with sermon not yet completed, I took time to read a novel, that book, that I showed you, and it's a thin, I think y'all here will enjoy it. It's a thinly veiled fictional account of a UU church's year long search for a new senior minister. And a longtime friend of mine, a guy I've known since I was seven, 60 years, read it, read a review in the New York Review of Books and shared it with me when he visited here a month ago. And the time he felt right, and I was ready for an easy breezy novel to finish out my summer after a year of having weighed through several weighty books that speak to the conflicts of our time. But this book was anything but easy and breezy for me as it struck too close to home following in excruciating detail the process and conflicts, the lofty goals and the petty politics within that search committee, their church and UUism in general. And in reading reviews of the book and an interview with the author, I was able to confirm what I had suspected while reading the book. Michelle Hunovan is a UU, attended seminary, and served on a search committee. And so here's what some of what she had to say about the book. She, she, she said uh, in an interview, when I started writing this book, I had, I had heard so many stories immediately. You know, like I was on a search committee to select a dean, and I pushed for this one woman, and we got her and she's been a total disaster or just the opposite. I was on a search committee for an archdeacon and my candidate wasn't selected, but I have to admit that the one who was has been the right person. It's fallible. Human beings are fallible. We're not really good at knowing what we want. That's why advertising is so effective. One of the things that the main character, Dana, is going through is she's searching for more connection to her church or maybe a new community and always for new friends. When she first came to the church, her mother had just died and she was grieving her mother. And she has come to this place where she can sit and weep and feed her soul. What she finds are a bunch of older women who take her in and give her approval and kind of give her the finishing touches to push her into adulthood. I believe in what's called process theology, that we are all part of this ongoing process and that God is part of that process too. And we are this ever churning process of becoming. So we are all searching and we are all becoming. I like to think that anyone who's ever done time on a committee will find something to relate to in this book. People have a common goal and they also have personalities and those frequently come into contact, conflict with each other. And I will just close with something one reviewer wrote about this book. He, uh, he wrote, Search, uh, an appro appropriate title on several levels, takes a surprisingly amusing account of ecclesiastical politics in the age of wokeness and to a letter, lesser extent, Dana's own pursuit of spiritual and personal fulfillment. Leave aside the worst case scenarios, the pulpit is filled with perils for even the best intention. Ideally, ministers must be inspiring speakers, wise counselors, able fundraisers and administrators. They must navigate among clashing congregational factions. They must boost the membership and repair the leaky roof. The task of choosing a new minister can be equally treacherous because, as Dana observes, a church is a human structure. We build it and inhabit it, and immediately stories and secrets abound within. Anyone out there relate to that at all? I think probably. <laughs> I see a nod from Richard there. So um, we're gonna take a little break for some music. Uh, and I just wanna explain what I'm about to show you. Um, uh, it's almost two, two months ago, September, November, three months ago now, the end of June, uh, Joan and I went to uh, Pinewoods Camp in Plymouth, Massachusetts for, for a week long uh, workshop uh, teaching 
what we call, still call international folk dance, uh, except one of the teachers was a guy from Hawaii. And um, his name is Kawika Alfice, but he, he, we call him Kumu. And he brought one of his dancers, uh, Toby, to demonstrate hula. And I remember the first night of camp, he said, this is not tourist stuff, hula is prayer. And I'm going to teach you right. So you got to move and you got to move your hands and you got to, you know, it's the whole nine yards. And um, so I got to know Kumu and Toby pretty well. And what was amazing to me is, I don't know, I'm just talking to them and we meet with, they have the after parties. We are, we are swap, we're swapping our hooch during the parties and, and talking stuff. And one after like three nights, Toby says to me, you know, this is the first group of essentially all white people where I've not felt like something different. I just feel like a person here. And I take that as a badge of honor. That meant so much to me. And, and what you'll see in this video, Kumu wrote this song, sings it, and he's taught, he's literally taught hula all over the world. And he did this video, you see hula from country after country. And this is other cultures, except taking a piece of this culture from Hawaii, and we're all one together. It's called Hula Around the World. And let's see if I can get this thing started. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, you might want to have hankies ready. It's that good. Sorry, I, I had to, I've had, I had to stop it. I forgot to put on the original sound. My bad. Let me back this thing up. You got to hear this in all its glory. Let's try this take two. Joan warned me to do this and I forgot. Here we go. It's not good. I'm, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to pull it up from the web. I apologize. This was, this was not planned. I, it's, it worked in rehearsal, don't they always? Um, we liked this, what we heard so far. Oh, it, it's such a, a wonderful, um, uh, it's under Kumu Hula. Okay, uh, let's just bring it up here. <sighs> Sorry, I got to get the link. Okay, one second, and it's here we go. All right, let's launch that, and then I hope I can screen share this thing. And, all right, now let's go back to here and screen share it. If I can just find Zoom again, there it is. All right. We were so worried that um, that it would the the online thing would freeze. <laughs> Oops. All right. Here we go. Let's try this again. <laughs> I seem to be plagued by tech problems in running this thing. 
Shall I give it another go? Sure. Let's try one last time, and I'll just pick up where we left off. In, 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 my... Hope you all enjoyed that as much as I do. Yeah, Joan, Joan put the translation of the lyrics into the chat for those of you who are interested in such things. Um, okay, moving right along. So, um, this is only the third time I, I've joined you all for one of these um, UMIAC Third Wednesday services though I, I will say I watched several others from the archive videos and there's some good stuff there and I, I have heard many fine presentations about how the current leadership of the UUA and its affiliated entities have veered into illiberalism and in this I'm grateful to Todd Agloff, uh, Mel Pine, Jay Kiskell and so many others for articulating the current situation so well and tonight I'd like to offer my view on where we ought to go from, from here and how we might get there. The, that view is informed by my training, as Richard said, as a behavioral optometrist and a counselor, peer counselor, admittedly, but as well as a dozen years of experience in electoral politics as a member of the Democratic Party. Uh, and I'm a member of the Wayland Democratic Town Committee, served five years as vice chair and two years as the chair of that uh, committee. Also, uh, for 11 years, uh, co-edited a statewide publication uh, of all things democratic that really helped get the word out about our, our events. But that's not my main purpose tonight. In fact, uh, this there was a concern at Channing Church before they would hire me to be their preacher. They, uh, you know, politics is often seen as a dirty business and we certainly don't want to bring partisan politics into our churches and I reassured them with what I will tell you tonight. 
that my involvement in politics is to help bring our UU values, those we here in UMIAC are trying to defend, into politics, not the other way around. And right now, the Democratic Party is the only one where they those values seem to be welcome. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I'll just go off script a little bit and just say I grew up in Nelson Rockefeller's New York State, liberal governor, and uh, there was a little more choice back then, but not so much now, but hopefully this country will get back to something like that. So, in my, so my purpose, I feel, is in line with what that great 20th century Unitarian theologian, James Luther Adams, said about what he called liberal religion in his 1976 essay, Five Smooth Stones of Liberalism. I have a copy of the book here that Joan got for me from the Boston College Library because it's out of print. And if you weren't around back in the day, you can't get it now. But anyway, so he wrote this essay. I'm sure many of you here are familiar with it. The Five Smooth Stones of Liberalism, by which he meant liberal realism, liberal, re, religious liberalism. And here's a little bit of what he wrote. The faith of the liberal must express itself in societal forms, in the forms of education, in economic and social organization, in political organization. Without these, freedom and justice in community are impossible. The faith of a church or of a nation is an adequate faith only when it inspires and enables people to give of their time and energy to shape the various institutions, social, economic, and political of common life. The creation of justice in community requires the organization of power. Injustice in community is a form of power and abuse of power, and justice is an exercise of just and lawful institutional power. <clears throat> Those six sources of our living tradition include words and deeds of prophetic women and men and tell us to, among other things, heed the gui guidance of reason and the results of science. There are, of course, myriad sources and even my best of picks run too long for a presentation of this length Though I will say I wrote five different versions of tonight's presentation and, and at some point included every one of them. Uh, so um, so uh, I would be happy to uh, extend, expand on this at any point, either during the conversation uh, afterwards tonight or in subsequent personal conversation. I am a Zoom host. I can meet up with anyone just like we are doing now. Uh, so I will admit that I, I struggled with preparing this sermon much more than I had imagined. I mean, I, two years in the pulpit, and I, I also ran the summer services at First Parish here in Wayland last summer, but it's been a year, and I don't know. I Anyway, um, but when I read that book, Search, it, it turned out to give me a pathway towards framing tonight's sermon, and the theme that Michelle Hunnaman lays out in what was for me that excruciating detail is a fairly generational divide, though not exclusively so, between the old and the young, between those who think that change should be evolutionary, like me, and those rather than evolutionary, like them, those who would see social action flowing naturally out of spiritual growth, like me, and a deepening spirituality and those who would give radical change and social action primacy. And in all of this, I've come to see, what I've come to see is a return to the very issue that first led Unitarianism and Universalism to establish themselves as separate denominations some 200 years ago, that of orthodoxy versus liberalism in religious thinking. Like many, if not most of you, I believe that what UMIAC, Fifth Principal Project, and others are resisting is a return by the UUA to a new orthodoxy that would place a creedal faith in a, and top-down denominational enforcement on what they call radical welcome over our more liberal belief that we must offer many paths toward that same goal of ending the many oppressions and injustices that still plague us on our way to that more perfect union in America. Our view as I'm sure you know, is rooted in the present seven principles, James Luther Adams's five smooth stones of liberal religion and other sources. Theirs is rooted in Ibram Kendi, Robin DiAngelo, 
as borne out by Kendi being given this year's Ware Lecture at GA, General Assembly, and the U Unitarian Universalist Association publishing D'Angelo's White Fragility and similar books. Now, I will lay my cards on the table. I am more or less with those who are ready to declare a schism. It's a sad fact of life that eventually the old must give way to the young. I do not believe that we will win the denominational fight with the UUA, as I believe the present administration already has too much power to be stopped. But as Michelle Hunnevin said, human beings are fallible. We're not really good at knowing what we want. That's why advertising is so effective. So tonight, I'm going to talk about how my professional training, which has a lot in common with the principles of advertising, can inform us how to message our fellow UUs and their churches in order to bring over a to bring them over to a better understanding of the liberal perspective so that they might choose it for themselves and their churches. So in neuroscience, it is said, neurons that fire together wire together, meaning that the more a signal is passed from one neuron to another, the two actually form a more robust physical connection. One that makes it more likely that this pathway will be favored over a rival one. And this is how neural networks are built, forming blocks of habitual association. Now, these networks are influenced by our generic, genetic inheritance for sure, but mostly form based on experiences early in life. But these associations are not necessarily the ones that serve us best, at least not in the long term. Now, the good news is that neuroscientists also say that when these more tightly wired neurons fire together less, then they unwire. These facts underlie the trend the training I received in both behavioral optometry and counseling and also explain much of politics. Now, one of my teachers, his name is Dr. Paul Harris, he wrote a book called Behavioral Vision Care and in it he said this, behavioral optometrists define vision as the ability to derive meaning and to direct action as triggered by light. Vision is much more than simply seeing clearly it is the entire process whereby an individual understands what he or she sees and uses, sorry, what he or she sees and uses this information to direct his or her actions. Deriving meaning and directing action. Using what you understand to direct your actions. These words struck me like a bolt of lightning and I could see that their application went far beyond vision care. And that is reflected in a book called Becoming Real, Overcoming the Stories We Tell Ourselves That Hold Us Back by psychiatrist Gail Saltz. She wrote, the stories we tell ourselves as children to make sense of the world around us are the cause of most of our adult problems. Becoming Real, that book, illustrates how to find those stories and rewrite them so that we can be free of the past of repeating history and start down the road of taking control, being stronger and having the best relationships of our lives. Emotional pain and difficulty that a story you told yourself as a child about how life should be and about who you are isn't working anymore. It's a story that looks like the truth, but it is not. And I would say that the role of emotions was also emphasized in the counseling I learned, practiced, and eventually taught, in particular how they interfere with rational thought. And it taught that what's particularly difficult is that we're usually unaware of how much our resulting irrationality controls us, steers us away from a model of humanity that they called the human side of human beings. Interesting to me, is how much that model overlaps with what we Unitarian Universalists believe. Inherent goodness of people, importance of freeing the mind, of love being the true expression of humanity, the joy of community as well as contemplation, that we can rise above our troubles to become the kind of people who can lead in making this a better world, and that there are many individual expressions of that. 
Now, in behavioral optometry, we are concerned not just with making, with making our eyes see clearly, but also helping them to work together as a team to provide smooth, efficient functioning for learning, eye-hand coordination, balance, and more. We say this is the difference between seeing easy and just seeing clearly. And this is achieved through a program of what we call vision therapy, providing what Dr. Harris called meaningful opportunities to learn to see things in a new way and which makes life a lot more fulfilling. That derived deriving of meaning and directing of action can go into a very inefficient mode under what's called stress. In optometry, we call it near point stress. It usually comes from reading, but stress is a natural part of life. And there is both a physical and mental expression of it. Our visual and other cognitive systems literally go into a stress posture when the demand overwhelms our ability to handle the load. And under stress, our bodies secrete stress hormones. So it's no wonder that it was a 20th century endocrinologist by the name of Hans Selye who made this important statement. It's not stress that kills us. It is our reaction to it. Selye articulated a difference between what he called distress, a term most of us understand well, but also its opposite, which he called eustress, E-U as a prefix, meaning good, helpful, positive, the kind that lifts us up, giving us the means for not just surviving, but enjoying life. And I tell you in general, it's stimulus and response. If you don't have something driving you forward, you just become inert. Now, on the, so on the one hand, uh, distress would cast us down. It's not stress that kills us. It is our reaction to it. So how then shall, shall we react to stress? And in dealing with vision, visual stress, we behavioral optometrists always offer the patient three choices after doing our visual evaluation to reveal what we call skews of perception. Now, we could do nothing, but you'll remain symptomatic, struggling to make your way through life with an inefficient visual system. Uh, we can sometimes give you compensatory lenses. It's like a crutch. Uh, maybe, or maybe some other coping mechanisms uh, to at least ameliorate some of your suffering, although it wouldn't solve the problem. Or we can give you a therapeutic program of vision therapy and perhaps some what we call therapeutic lenses, not to see more clearly, but to see easier. Often work two together. Uh, so we see something similar to this in human behavior. Faced with stress, some people will go to great pains to avoid it. Their whole lives are designed to insulate themselves from these stressors or anything that might possibly lead them into such stress. But I don't think that's much of a life. I, I hope you don't either. Not if I have a better way to offer them. You see where this is going? I think you do. Sometimes people will turn to compensatory behaviors, those crutches or coping mechanisms we sometimes employ, like overindulging in food, alcohol, or cannabis. And sometimes people lean heavily on a rigid adherence to a particular polit political belief or religious creed. And I would further stipulate that in asserting that this is a faith without cre a creed, Unitarian Universalism announces to the world that we are all about freeing the mind, offering not just that compensatory solution, but a truly therapeutic one. And this is why I am somewhat evangelical about Unitarian Universalism as anyone at First Parish in Wayland will attest. But I say, what higher cause can there be in all its implications? Now, my concern is that while we may rightfully assert that we are a faith without a creed, we should be mindful that in the process, we do not also become a faith without faith. Faith in our own process, that through our living into those seven principles, using what lessons we can find meaning, meaningful from among all six source categories, as I call them, we can turn distress into eustress, moving ever closer to being an ever better expression of the best of humanity and doing so with great enjoyment. I think this is what Theodore Parker was talking about when he spoke of the transient and the permanent in Christianity. 
It's about those values that the Christian Bible talks about rather than the creedal belief in the divinity of Jesus. And I believe that this is the difference between liberal religion and conservative or orthodox religion. Now, for a good description of what liberal religion should ask of us, I turn to James Luther Adams and his five smooth stones of religion. A bigger piece of it you heard earlier, just to quickly run through them for those that don't have them in their head as I do. Uh, one, uh, liberal religion depends on the principle that revelation is continuous, ongoing. There is no one sacred text. Uh, two says all relations between persons ought to be rest on mutual free consent and not on coercion, from which I say, therefore, it is not confessional. And I think we all know who preaches confession at the General Assembly. It involves the establishment of a just and loving community. There's plenty you can do on your own, but to get the whole package, you need community such as ours here in Umiac and in our churches, physical churches. Four is that social incarnation that we talked about, and I see this as meaning our ideas and ideals won't matter unless they become manifest in the institutions of society, including its laws. And that's why I tried to take these values into the Democratic Party. And but I like number five, which sounds exactly like what we do with the behavioral optometry. If you do these things, it is very hopeful. Now put this all together. And what starts to emerge is a checklist that you can use to assess whether you, your friends and family, your co-religionists are living a life of eustress or distress, of perception and misdirected action, or more effective and efficient functioning. And what will work best in offering an alternative, our alternative to illiberalism? Again, I had this voluminous list that I wrote up, but we've got to keep things to, to time to short. So I'm just going to name a few of my favorite expressions, which ends up sounding like a statement of creed. Uh, and again, I'm happy to share reams more of this stuff with anyone who wants to talk to me about it. So I believe in the complete liberation of the human spirit and that no one would willingly choose to live in a lesser state of grace. I believe that the highest purpose in life is to become better human beings, the kind who can together make this a better world. I believe in the free mind and an open heart filled with loving kindness. I believe in what's true and what works. Your way may not be my way, but it's okay if it still gets you there. I believe that when we live these things, we find we have much more in common with each other than divides us and are able to not see every disagreement as a call to arms. I believe that this is what our UU faith calls us to and why I will use and promote the use of these ideas in everyday living and in our churches. That, that was the short list. Again, I have reams more. Um, you may ask why we should work so hard to save our churches. And here I turn to a great universalist, Olympia Brown, from her final sermon delivered in 1920, when she was 88 years old, uh, on the verge of casting her first ever vote in an election. She was one of the few original suffragists to still be alive to do that. And here's what she said, by the way, there is a reading that says it's this, but there is a slight change in the gray hymnal they replace her use of the pronoun you with us. But I think I like it better in its original form because I'm talking, um, this whole thing, all this perception is centered on oneself. Our perceptual world starts with us. That's why a source I felt I didn't have time to name uh, by, she's actually a law professor, Rhonda McGee in, in San Francisco, wrote a book called The Inner Work of spiritual justice, and I do recommend it. So uh, this is speaking to us, our inner work, our inner faith, and projecting it outwards. Dear friends, stand by this faith. Work for it and sacrifice for it. There is nothing in all the world so important to you as to be loyal to this faith which has placed before you the loftiest ideals, which has comforted you in sorrow, strengthened you for noble duty, and made the world beautiful for you. 
Do not demand immediate results, but rejoice that you are worthy to be entrusted with this great message and that you are strong enough to work for a great true principle without counting the cost. Go on finding ever new applications of these truths and new enjoyments in their contemplation. May it be so, and let us say, Amen. Amen. We don't actually pass the plate, but we uh, push for membership. Um, we are the Unitarian Universalist Multiracial Unity Action Council. Uh, UMIAC is the way we pronounce our uh, acronym there. Um, we, uh, our, we are an organization that was uh, denied the opportunity to purchase a, a booth at the exhibit hall at the General Assembly this past June. And uh, the UUA Vice President, Carrie McDonald, explained it was because our mission was incompatible with the core values of the UUA. And we, we found that very puzzling because uh, our mission is to promote multiracial unity in our congregations uh, using the seven UU principles. And we have a lot of difficulty seeing what is uh, in conflict with UU values about that. But then that, that gave us an insight. Um, the reason we were denied uh, permission, I believe, is because we don't support the, the uh, assessment that UU culture is white supremacist. We consider that fraudulent. Uh, we, we are we're interested in fighting racism, just like the UUA, but we don't agree with that assessment, which leads us to think that the UUA officials and other national UU officials are actually less interested in fighting racism than they are in promoting this assessment that UU culture is white supremacist, which uh, confirms an earlier perception we had had that, that the uh, the biggest obstacle to promoting multiracial unity in our congregations is actually the UUA's supposedly anti-racist <laughs> ideology, which uh, we find is not anti-racist. It's, it's, we find it is actually racist. It, uh, it's anti-white racist right on the surface, but, uh, but in a subtle but very important way, it's, it's anti-black and brown racist. It's racist in an anti-black and brown way. It doesn't it, it, it doesn't benefit the black and brown rank and file. It infantilizes them. It, it, um, it is condescending toward them. It doesn't benefit any black or brown people except a few insiders in the UUA. Certainly not the black and brown rank and file. So that's why we exist. We're going to focus not on fighting with the UUA, but rather in serving our congregations who now given what the UUA is doing, our congregations are now left without any competent organized council on the subject of fighting racism. That's who we are. We hope you take a look at our website. Our, our, our website's very old fashioned looking. Try, to, uh, try not to notice that too much. Notice instead what we have to say. Well, I'm kind of old fashioned looking, so maybe it's appropriate. Um, by the way, we have a little bit of a book club going here. If I could offer one more title, Say It Loud by Harvard Law Professor Randall Kennedy, uh, subtitled On Race, Law, History, and Culture. Um, maybe someone will put that in the chat. Uh, but we're wrapping things up. We're up against a hard break, as they say in radio. So uh, we're going to, I invite you to. Um, Again, uh, be muted, but sing along on our closing hymn, number 318, We Would Be One. And let's launch that, and hopefully it'll work. And boom, and go. Let's see if that'll work. Join in singing. 
like to thank um, Polly Oliver for giving us those those piano tracks. She's actually the music director and choir director at First Parish in Wayland. I'm not sure they know she did that. Maybe they're going to want to defellowship her. Who knows? Um, I offer this benediction. Uh, James Luther Adams ended that Five Smooth Stones essay saying this. Anyone who does not enter into that struggle with the affirmation of love and beauty misses the mark and thwarts creation as well as self-creation. Thus, with all the realism and tough-mindedness that can be mustered, the genuine liberal finally can hear and join the hallelujah chorus, intellectual integrity, social relevance, amplitude of perspective, and the spirit of true liberation offer no less. Hmm. Amen. And I believe that concludes. Thank you. We we usually end with a completely open conversation. This this can be a conversation with the preacher about the uh, the the sermon, but it can also be about just about anything. And it has in the past been about just about anything and we we continue until we seem to get tired and most people have left and you know we're getting out of gas and so forth and then we stop uh if you would use the um raise hand option at the bottom of the screen it may simply say raise hand it may say reactions in which case if you press that raise hand becomes an option if you raise your hand it creates a little yellow hand in the upper corner of your window and it puts your window uh, at the front so that uh, you can be called on in order. Ken Christensen. Richard, are you, are you, are you gonna chaperone this thing and call on the speakers? Yeah, yeah. Okay, then yeah. I will just lay back. Okay, Ken. Yeah, what I wanna say is that um, when you keep doing what you're doing, you are exerting power. When we keep, believing and co communicating and relating even to those amongst us who become total converts to this other way we're exerting power um, and if they challenge us and say you're racist or something like that we can respond to the challenge we don't have to bring it up we can continue doing what we're doing thank you dick dick burkhardt now, when I went to the GA this year, uh, attendance participation was down by one quarter from last year. And this was this included both in-person uh, participant attendance and online attendance. And I found that quite shocking. Um, the UUA board chair, co-moderator, co -moderator, Meg Riley, when I asked her about the other day, said, oh, that's just Zoom fatigue. Do you have any other ideas as to what's going on? 
and membership is down substantially and RE is down very substantially. Yes. John Cohen, did, were you trying to put your hand up? Oh, there you go. You, or you succeed. Okay, let, let me let uh, uh, Jay speak first. Yeah, yeah. Or, or whoever wants to, if, if Matthew, if you have any ideas what to do about that. Yeah. What? Well, well, Dick, I, I don't have an answer, but I do have an imperative. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something about what can we do? And we are really the stewards of Unitarian Universalism, and there have been stewards before us. And they have nurtured the denomination through its other storms and left us something that I'm proud of to call my seven principles. So what is going to happen in about eight or nine months is there's going to be a vote at some general assembly, virtual or what, about the first wave of changes, the first vote for changing Article 2. And I implore everyone to get with their minister and other folks to begin discussion groups on Article 2 study commission and talk about us being stewards of Unitarian Universalism. And if it is to change, and I'm, I'm not pleased with the changes I've seen so far, but if it is to change, let us do it in a way that is thoughtful with some scholarship behind it, as opposed to I'm too disinterested or I don't care. So I think it's important that we really get back to our congregations that are now meeting more and more in person and have discussion groups. And I'd be happy to supply any information people think may be appropriate. I, I'm using a section from my book on a men's retreat next month uh, to have that exact same discussion. So think of ourselves as stewards, and this is our time to make sure that the denomination will have the same, bearing the same fruits as it did when we first came to it. John, you're muted, I think. Uh, I, I may be the first one here, uh, or only one here, who who uh, went to the first GA of the UUA, and four of us go from Chicago, where we were studying to be Unitarian ministers. Uh, three of us were, and one was an exchange student from Japan, uh, to Boston. And as we were coming in the foggy suburbs west of Boston, uh, David Bumble piped up and said, you know, when, and I was excited about the merger, uh, when there's decay, there's merger, and when there's <laughs> energy, there's schism. Uh, now I take those words as inspirational. At that point, I thought, who's the wet blanket we brought along on this trip? I'll leave it for there. I, I'll have more things to say if you let me, but. Thank you. Matt? Hi. Someone has an open mic that's really, oh. Finley? I think it may be tech help, actually. Finley's no. now, Finley's now muted. Okay, I, I just wanna say that um, I, I, I have tried to promote in the Democratic Party and, and also in Unitarian Universalism, what, what is called messaging, which is how to sell it. I should just say that, I don't know, 2005, I was asked to be on a regional Metro West round table saying, how can we better promote Unitarian Universalism? Because at the time, uh, they thought they'd done a great job. The original uh, test shot for what how to promote Unitarian Universalism, I don't know if you all remember this, was just us making love which reads okay, but when you say it like that, it sounds a little strange. Justice making love. And um, so I, I, thank you, Mariah. I, I see the guffawing there, I, yes. And so they had pivoted to the uncommon denomination. And I said, that's a terrible slogan. I understand why you say it. There's not many like this, but I call it the all-American religion. I say this was the spirit in which that infused the uh, the De Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and I think there's scholarship to back that up, and uh, I think we can do a better job of promoting it. 
My concern ongoing is in talking to not the UUA, but to the churches, to those ministers, uh, many of whom, like was said, uh, the analogy for me is like when you read the Lord of the Rings, there's the happy hobbits in the Shire. They're just living their lives. They don't see the creeping darkness coming about to overwhelm them. And so that's a concern I have for the home church here in, in Wayland. And I've been doing little back channel things, talking to some of the playas in there. And that's what the Randall Kennedy uh, group uh, was doing. And I think Randall Kennedy's book is a great way to sort of introduce this topic because Kennedy I, again, there wasn't time to include everything. His concluding paragraphs are extremely what we would think, we here would think of as being you you ish And so, it, and his, his look at this, it, it informed me so well, and it speaks quite well to the time. And, and my little group there, they pretty much got it. Although what, there's one guy in particular I'm concerned about him. He still thinks, what's the problem with the eighth principle? Of course we want to end racism. And so I'm still working on it, but I got a chance. All right, so I will yield back. But thank you so much for giving, again, for giving me this opportunity. And I hope we get a chance to further explore these topics of messaging and how to really sell it like advertising. Thank you. Finley, you're muted. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Brother Matthew, though you don't see yourself as a pragmatist, you're one of the good pragmatists that come up with the ideas that can allow the framework to, for the prophetic side to have some real impact. As one body said, Isaiah would have been a voice crying in the wilderness had not somebody wrote down what he said. The issue of, the, of Article 2, uh, I discovered that when I was preaching down in Kokomo uh, and trying to go beyond seven principles. You know, we, we see seven principle sources. But when I actually took a look at Article 2, I had looked at it before, but sort of didn't think about it because I thought it was permanent. <laughs> I never knew the idea of eliminating whatever emerged. And it has a, it, it's really a compendium of the vision of 61. Now, I knew Brother David Bombach. I, I, I communicated him a couple of times, and he just said, oh, it's a waste of time. UUism is doomed. It, it will go into the trash can of history. Uh, and, and he said, once we lost our way, the healing of the earth. But I think what happened in 61, John Cohen, a Quan, we really need to know that a little bit more. The, the four, four guys traveling all the way from Chicago to Boston. We need that narrative. We need to revisit the energy, we thought, that was unleashed in 61. <laughs> the spirit of 61. How about that as a slogan? At any rate, here we are. So the Article Two battle is an excellent battleground. It brings together whether you're UMIAC or non-UMIAC. We want to show how precious, how powerful, and how how energizing. If you read the whole thing, all the pieces about the purposes, about the sources, about that centerpiece that Wesley so brilliantly uh, declaimed on the freedom, the freedom clause, the liberty clause. Here it is, the core. I certainly can't have the right to believe whatever I want to within the framework, in the framework of the fourth principle. And if, if my beliefs cannot be tested with responsible data, then I have to think about my beliefs. Anyway, uh, I just, we're, 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 we're contemplating in November, November 9th, uh, 2022, a convocation on the Article 2. And a small group of us going to be meeting this Saturday. I'd like to remind that small group, which is Wesley, myself, uh, Beverly, and uh, Brother Jack Wright, and uh, Brother Matthew. And we're going to kind of hammer out how we want to approach it. What is it? How is it? Why is it? The big three in dealing with this vital, vital part of what makes us you use. So uh, we're, we're, we're going we're to wrestle with it. UBAC will lead the way on this one, and Jay will lead your information. Particularly, Jay, I know there are two versions of Article 2. There's the first one, they had a non-discrimination clause, which I believe was amended out. And then there's a second one that has the inclusion clause. Give me some help, brother. Send me a note about how I can get a hold of those two versions. Um, I, I, first of all, if you, I hate to say it, if you buy the book, I'll give you the page numbers, brother. Good, good. Thank you. I'll, go, I'll look at my copy. Okay. Mariah. 
Yeah, um, wanted to quickly speak to something that Jay said about getting our congregations to actually look at the Article Two Study Commission. I would like to report that Y East out here in Portland is in fact doing that, and I am on that uh, group. Um, it's quite a commitment over eight meetings, uh, two hours or so each with another hour and a half of homework in between each time. But um, the, or, the uh, congregation I'm particularly a part of right now is doing that. And uh, something that uh, Brother Matthew said um, about the hobbits. And I would like to bring everyone's attention, those, those of you who are Tolkien fans, um, the hobbits, when it came to it, were made of somewhat sterner, sterner stuff than anybody bothered to give them credit for. For. So let us only hope that the congregations that aren't paying attention are in fact much like the hobbits and when push comes down to shove they will mightily rise to the to the challenge. Done. I don't know <clears throat> what the membership of my first uh, Unitarian church that I that I uh, Came acquainted with is is these days, but I'm heartened to see both uh, uh, Finley and uh, Marie from First Unitarian in Chicago because that was my refuge when I was ten, and the fundamentalists uh, came to teach the fifth grade boys about the leap of faith at the Baptist uh, was Baptist Church up on Woodlawn, a, a block north. Now it's called Hyde Park Union Church. But my parents sent me to Sunday school, and I said I was done after I heard about Leap of Faith, which we never talked about in the American Baptists up near the University of Chicago. But they needed Sunday school teachers, and and I argued with a fellow, and I said to my parents I was done with Sunday school, but I, I wasn't done. I didn't get away with that one, but uh, I could choose. And the Unitarians were one block less to walk and no special leaps required. And uh, that's why, you know, but when I knew First Unitarian, when I was a member back in the 60s of First Unitarian in Chicago, we had more than 400 members. I think you guys are, are down a bit lower than that now. Uh, here in Austin, Texas, uh, we joined when there were six or 700 members back in 2009. And we're listing now 450 members. Uh, so these Unitarian churches are not, not doing too well. Uh, Sinkford's in Portland, Oregon is down about 11% in the last uh, 12 years. And it, it, the population of Portland's just gone up 11%. Uh, my interest is in helping out directly. I, I, I do agree with Bumble on the, you know, the UUA gone, gone, well, all of you on the UUA gone berserk. Uh, I'm more interested in, you know, forgetting about the UUA altogether. Uh, I think those lemmings are, 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 are in charge and they're leading that into the sea. And uh, I, I think Bumbo's words are now inspirational. It's a time of energy and uh, time for that. Uh, I wanna say one more thing before I keep quiet here. And that is that Richard Trudeau has a Facebook page, and there are a lot of sensible people on that page. And it's interesting to be on Unitarian Facebook pages. I'm on about 12 and find that the one that is, is really a lot of more sensible things than any other is the one with only 123 members. That's the fifth principal group started by Richard Trudeau. No, no, no. Didn't, you didn't start it? No, no, no. That's uh, Jay Kiskell and Frank Casper. All right. Well, Jay, Jay and Frank, then. Uh, uh, thank you for starting that, because uh, that's a place where we can have some sensible uh, dialogue that I would encourage you all to, if you're on Facebook, to get on the Fifth Principle group. And uh, Nancy Halderman has been on, I know, and, uh, you know, perhaps others of you. So. Uh, that's enough on my pitch uh, that you, you, 
churches are not doing that well, as you've already said. And uh, I take examples of what's happened in Austin, Texas, and what's happened at, I think, first in Chicago. I think you're down to a bit less than 400 members uh, there, if I'm correct, maybe quite a bit less. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't think what's what they're doing is selling. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think if it was really worthwhile to people, uh, the people in the churches would be telling their friends, hey, come to the Unitarian Universalists. They're, 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 they're really something. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jay. Well, in keeping with a very skilled um, former board member of a Unitarian Universalist organization, I'm going to ask two things for other people to do things. And the first thing is Mariah, I, I'm hitting enter to give you my email address. Could you send me the curriculum or notes that you're using in your work sessions? Uh, that would be wonderful. Whatever you have doesn't need to be polished. And I'm going to ask Paul Avery, who is frozen with his dogs, the best dad there. If Paul would speak a bit, he's done some excellent work on numbers that I think we should share and have people know about, about the national organization. Paul, are you willing to do that? Uh, yeah, I, I should. I've been working on it actually a, a lot more since I, I last talked to you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've been looking at the at the national statistics, uh, looking, I mean, first comparing the, you know, the membership numbers that have been posted on the UUA side forever, you know, going from 1961 to 2020, those are basically just summary numbers. They basically just say the number of congregations, number of UU members, and the, and the number of RE enrollment, you know, the total RE enrollment, but they're just total numbers. Uh, I, I recently found out, uh, based on one of the people who posted in the Fifth Principle Project, uh, that there are uh, additional numbers that are posted per congregation. You know, they're much more detailed statistics. And I and turn out these have a lot of problems, uh, and that's why it's taken so long to go through them. I've been trying to analyze the data. It's certainly true that there, and no matter how you cut it, there has been a loss in membership along the way, and a lot of it's taken place in the last two years, which of course you could ascribe to the pandemic, um, obviously. Uh, but the RE enrollment in particular has taken a dramatic nosedive even for before 2021. So even as late as 2020, the, the numbers are way down for the RE. And if you look at the fraction of RE, you know, the number of RE members divided by the number of members, it's, it's, it looks, it's, a, it's on a death spiral. Um, there's also problems with the statistics, and I, I, I haven't reached out yet to the UUA to explain some of these things. For example, uh, some of the congregations just don't report. I mean, uh, some of them still exist because I go to the UUA site and look for them and they still seem to exist, uh, but a number of them just are not reporting and maybe that's what means that they're not a certified organization. So there's still some confusion, but uh, the, the main reason I got into this is that I was looking at the number of members in the UUA as a fraction of the US population. And this, that is very clear. I mean, our numbers at best, at best are static probably falling, but at best static, but the population of the US has grown dramatically since the early 1960s. And that ratio is a simple number. I've got all the numbers for the population. You just divide them and you just plot the number of UU members uh, per million US residents and it's a falling curve. Uh, some, you know, some of you have seen this already on the fifth principle side, I've posted some graphs there. And as I said, I spent the last three weeks kind of working on the numbers behind the scenes, trying to understand the statistics in more detail, but that's basically the bottom line. Mm -hmm. yeah, Matt, if I could jump in. First of all, I want to thank Paul enormously for going down the rat hole. And uh, thank you for willing to reach out, because if I reached out, they would have just told me, um, shut up and die, um, why the numbers are the discrepancies. I make a larger observation about the numbers, Paul, yeah. and their, their lack of accuracy. Um, Groups manage what are important to them. And I don't think our national organizations sees membership as important because it does such a poor job of managing it. It, it, it is pretty poor. In fact, I found, after I talked to you a couple of weeks later, I found some complete howlers 
like the endowments being a thousand times too high. You know, it was well, one church went from you know two million, two million, two million, two billion, two million, <laughs> million, you know, things like that, or the RE, which had been you know 25, 28, 28, and then 2025. And that's still on the books. If you look at the website, it's it's still UUA still claims these, these numbers. I think that's absolutely true. There's just no one's really looking at the, these numbers. They're not validating them. They're not following up with congregations to make sure that they they ask if they can report. Uh, it just seems like, uh, but, I mean, the numbers are there. As I said, at least someone's collecting something. But the more you look at them, the more you scratch your head and you try to make sense of it. I mean, I mean, I know I'm a, myself. I need to talk to people about this because uh, I'm I'm driving myself crazy looking at it. Hmm. <laughs> I'm thank already crazy, but okay. Thank thank you, Paul. Matthew. Yes. Hi. Thanks uh, again. I want to appreciate all the work Paul and Jay are doing. I really appreciate it. And what I w was trying to do was again help us find a better way to sell it like that advertising that was talked about. Um, and to Mariah, I would just say, perhaps we can arrange a, a Yumiak, pick your choice, either second breakfast or 11 Zs. That's a Hobbit joke. Never mind. Um, speaking of which, you know, there was 11 so Zs. 11 Zs. 11 Zs. <laughs> Has to be 11 Zs. Uh, sure, because that's actually after the hour of church. But um, I, I just, um, well, uh, yeah, what you know that Unitarian Unitarian Universalists are lovers of good jokes. Uh, I, if I had had more time, I would have thrown one in. Uh, but perhaps you would allow me to to tell it now. Um, you know, inject a, a even more than Hobbit humor. Um, th this one struck me. Uh, I don't know if you remember from I don't know the '80s, a comic named Emo Phillips. I was a little down on him because he seemed to be like, "Look at me, I'm weird," but he actually has a couple of good jokes. So here, here this is one of my favorites. I was walking across the bridge one day, and I saw a man sitting on the ledge, about to jump off. So I ran over and I said, "Stop! Don't do it." Why shouldn't I? He said, "Well, there's so much you have to live for. Like what? Well." Are, are you religious? He said, yes. I said, well, me too. Are you Christian or Buddhist? Christian. Me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Protestant. Me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Baptist. Wow, incredible. Me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? Reformed Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879, or Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? He said, Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. I said, die, heretic scum, and pushed him off the bridge. I that seems relevant to what we're dealing with in Unitarian Universalism today. We could agree on seven out of eight points, but you failed number eight. Bam. Anyway. I hope you appreciated that. And if I offended someone, I am so sorry. So sorry. Yeah. Mariah. Yeah, I uh, wanted to throw a quick, uh, I guess, data point, for lack of a better term, to Paul. I have kids technically, I guess, in RE right now, they're eight and 10. And I will tell you from street level, there is nothing for a kid past the age of 12. And there is no bridge, no bridge, nothing from RE to an adult member of the congregation. Zilch. I have never seen a child get all the way through that especially the gauntlet, the like radio silence almost where there's nothing for a kid from 12 to the day they turn 18. And then suddenly, you know, if the kid is even still around at 18, there's this big ceremony. Congratulations, you're now a member. And I never see them bridge. I never see them actually wind up becoming a congregational member. So there is like this, they, somebody just made a decision and it pissed me off years ago when somebody said to me, oh, well, kids just don't go to church after 12, whatever, we don't, we can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, my kids are going to be that age soon, and I want them to bridge, and there's just nothing. Hmm. 
So, so there you go. That, that could be your answer to why the precipitous drop, not only in RE because they age out at 12, but then they never show up as adults later. Hmm. So, and that's just from street level, my, just my eyeballs. I, I don't have data to back me up, but there's that for what it's worth. Sounds like we need a UU infrastructure project to put more bridges. <laughs> Rebecca. Hi there. Hi. So, um, so I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio. I posted a little link in the chat. Um, we recently by accident discovered that the Article II uh, Commission is doing some feedback surveys and several of us at our church have participated in it and they have been quite interesting um they have a draft of the purposes clause and a draft of the freedom of belief clause and these are different than the ones that were presented at ga quite a bit different and what you do is you sign up for this it goes into a zoom uh, none of the members of the Article II Commission are actually there. It's just run by some tech moderators. They break you up into um, breakout rooms. There were five in mine. I've heard of groups from like three to seven. And you actually have conversation with the people in the room, in the breakout room. And if you actually speak up, particularly speak up early in a conversation, you can change some minds, erase some eyebrows, surprise some people. Um, mine was quite interesting. I thought I would be the only person there that was skeptical about these uh, drafts. But when we started speaking up, I did get other support. So I didn't feel so lost that there were other people too who were quite skeptical about what they're saying. And it was quite an interesting discussion. Then after the discussion is over, they give you a link where you can um, actually make written comments. I think the only thing the actual commission is going to see will be the written comments. Although the large group sessions were recorded, the breakout sessions were not recorded. Um, but they're very interesting. The freedom of belief clause in this draft appears as it does in the original, except uh, they've added this sort of very weak phrase at the end. But the problem is that we think that the principles are going to be eliminated altogether and they're going to be talking about values instead. And so the only thing left is the freedom of belief clause nothing else uh, really from the value statement was drafted that was at ga and that one is not being discussed right now these uh discussions go on until the end of the month so there is a link to sign up for these discussions in the chat and they will end at the end of the month and i have found them very useful and interesting thank you thank you uh, Finley. The UMIAC has emerged as a space for a broad area of discussion about UUA history, principles, articles. And certainly we are glad to be that space. But by 2024, the, the plan is for UMIAC to be the organized resistance to all forms of racism, both within and without the UUA. Those folks I call the activists, those who are seeking to build nuclei and chapters around our brochure, our call to action, we call multiracial Unitarian Universalism, they will form what we call in old politics, the vanguard of our work. Racism is the power that is destroying the UUA and racism, particularly what I call neo-racism led by the Afrocentrics is the key. We had a debate in our religious professional task force. Why would 
and I argued why, why this destructiveness? Why do they want to get rid of this nearly 400 year old great historic tradition, this breakout of improving theism until theism gets transformed into humanism? What would be the point? And we had different opinions and theories. Uh, but the one I want to share this right now is we can do all of this work. We can attend these meetings. We can try to salvage this and salvage that. But in the end, Yumiak must become a viable, strong alternative to whatever nonsense these folks put together. They're working, working diligently. Uh, certainly, they'll open the door. You can go to a meeting. You can go and make some suggestions. But there's a, it's like when we ran these folks for a, a board of trustees. We did everything we were supposed to do. We got the names, signatures, signed up with the nominating committee. We were attacked as if we were a bunch of barbarians. Uh, nasty accusations were made by top leaders of the uh, UUA. So we should be very careful in our energy. To, and if you have all this energy to go to these meetings, I think that's good. Do it. But unless we have in the back of our minds, we're going to build UMIAC, Unitarian Universalist Multiracial Unity Action Council, uh, then we'll have a broad range of things going on. But in the end, in 2024, this is what we agreed at one of our meetings. That's when the schism will be declared. John, that'll make you happy. But right now, it's in this two-year interregnum. Uh, we can either do this uh, internal uh, construction work, trying to get the votes, trying to get them discussions, et cetera. Or we can work on the main issue, building a strong uh, anti-racist, multiracial organization that will take the place of the NAACP, take the place of SNCC, take the place of the Poor People's Campaign, because we will be one single organization uh, trying to and broaden the races, Asian, Latin, black, red, white. So my, my advice is, yes, go to these meetings, but have no illusion, please, please have no illusion. Go to learn, go to teach, but in the end, build Yumiak. That would be my advice. Thank you. Nancy. I just wanted, wanted to second what Rebecca said, that I went to those discussions and I found them just really worthwhile. And, um, uh, and things that came up were like, they used the word liberation and there were several of us said that we wanted, uh, what about liberal? Uh, or um, and that we wanted it to be positive language. Um, yeah, so anyways, I just think it, it is worth worth doing and uh, it's interesting to see who you meet up with in your group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, Paul, yes. Yeah, can I make one more comment? Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, for bringing up the, some of these things. Uh, I wanted to mention that I was able to join the eighth principal learning community. It took me several attempts to do it, but they finally let me in. I just wanted to see what's going on there. What's interesting is that they've uh, they've been keeping track of how many uh, how many UU organizations, and mostly congregations, have adopted the eighth principle. Whatever that means. And as of late August, the number was something like 221. If you take away a few non-congregational organizations, it's probably more like 215, but they've gone up by about 100 since, since about a year ago. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention that, that uh, that's, just, that's just showing what's going on with the eighth principle, if, if people care to know. Mm -hmm. Matt. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I just speaking of eighth principle, so uh, Joan and I have spent a lifetime really doing what we call folk dance, and lately our the group we spend the most time at has been at First Parish in Waltham, Mass, and we're dancing, of course, in a social hall. And there is a bulletin board, and it there's a thing about eighth principle, and then other things promoting it. And I was struck by how they talk about multicultural, but at the same time they condemn white supremacist culture and uh, again I, I sure there has been racism and it's been embedded in our society but i think of race trainer anthony peterson you can find this on youtube 
He said, what I learned about racism from my white granddaughters. And um, he said, if you're white, you, 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 you have to be proud that you're white. You can't just be, be in shame because some people did racist or slave owners. I, I just thought I'd throw that out there that it almost seems like under the current promotion from the UUA, it's multicultural except for people who look like most of us. And uh, I, I am happy that we are multiracial here tonight, but um, I, like I said, I just thought I'd throw that out. I'm interested in what other people think. Mm -hmm. Jack. Yeah, hello everybody. Hi. What an interesting evening. I'm so glad I was here. And thank you, Finley, for organizing this organization which sponsored now so many inspiring sessions. Uh, what the UUA is doing right now is, I'm sure we all uh, know this, profoundly anti-democratic. There's a clique uh, that has uh, managed to, um, to worm its way into being in charge. Uh, that thinks that they have the exclusive line on truth. And anybody who doesn't agree with them is, um, is uh, verboten. We have to fight back against this. Uh, if you tell leaders of most of our congregations what's going on with the UA, they, they just don't believe it. It's too, it's too, isn't that right, Richard? It's too horrid, too horrendous to believe. Yeah, it's unbelievable. That, that people could be acting this way and with, see, with the committed intention. So we have to fight back because uh, it's now fallen to us to have the mission to save the UUA from itself. This is no exaggeration as I'm sure you're all aware. And so we have to recruit more of our friends and colleagues to join this organization, to support it, to boost our numbers, to join the Fifth Principle Project, thank you very much, uh, Jay, uh, on the web, and to fight back against the kind of anti-democratic um, reorganization that's uh, that's taking place. We have people in charge that are uh, that are as Finley would say neo-racist and ill-intentioned. I think of our vice president for example. Uh, and we cannot survive this way. We will we will as our membership figures show we will bite the dust because people are voting with their feet and they're saying I, I don't need to be part of it when they find out what's going on. So we need to let people know that there are still, there's still an organization fighting the good fight and holding up uh, the UU principles that we've always believed in and affirmed. And we have to fight for that so we can defeat the changes in the Article 2 revision at the next couple of general assemblies. Uh, if we don't do this, I'm afraid that the Unitarian movement organized in the time. So that's all I have. Yeah, thank you. Wesley, are Richard, you? Oh, Go ahead. I'm trying yeah. to I'm trying to raise my hand because I can't find the little hand on my computer. Yeah, it's a, it's down okay. at reactions. Uh, my, my, down at reactions. Yeah. Click yeah. on reactions. Wesley and yeah. Beverly, please please speak. Wesley, you go first. Okay. Okay, in 1968, we're, we're looking at what looks like a replay of 1968 and later, when the UUA almost collapsed. It was followed by Robert West, who tried to put us back in order. And the collapse after in that area happened because the generalist I don't know. It's my opinion from reading the book about the empowerment controversy, which is something like what we're going through now. The, um, uh, 
the same things happened, including a, a um, separate empowered black group which eventually broke away and left. Uh, there was a mess. Uh, and the reason I think it came to an end ultimately was probably because there wasn't any money left. The money started drying up because people, uh, people were told there was a, a voted general assembly a well-intentioned vote, but the problem was it had to do with this problem that was observed in 2000, the 2009 business, is that it did not actually represent what most of the congregations would have gone for. And as a result, it drained the money out of the UUA and the whole thing went down. However, it didn't die. It's the thing that wouldn't die. Uh, it came back. And that's something to think about because once, I don't know if it will happen that way again. There, there, you know, history doesn't necessarily happen the same way twice. But there's something like that. The other thing about uh, that I wanted to address was um, uh, the absence of youth groups have disappeared. That's partly because there wasn't that many of them. I'm here because I went through I went through the high school youth group, the junior high group, and I ended up in uh, at the college group. All the way through, oddly enough, that's where Singford came from. He was president of the uh, of what used to be LRY. Hmm. So there's something that needs to be done about that. Eventually, if we survive, there has to be a uh, a resurrection of the youth groups. Um, now, but one thing to remember too is that the people who are remembered in our history, and this begins with Channing, who uh, who didn't agree with much of what was going on and ultimately ended up really resigning and backing away from his pulpit. Uh, Theodore Parker, they wouldn't send him a get well card. And then uh, you can look at Emerson. All those that we remember are those that were the saving remnant. So we may indeed be the saving remnant yet. That's, this is my, my word of hope. We may be the saving remnant of, uh, of what's left, uh, as well as it's possible that when the money drains out, it's possible. And we've had had divisions. The Western UU Conference was all by itself for years. It went off, it even created a small mini, mini headquarters out in, out in Chicago. I can remember the remains of it. And um, the Free Religious Association broke away. They, it finally went back together again when everybody's opinion got closer to what it was. So I'm not sure that we're going to die. And uh, we also may be the saving remnant. Now I've talked far too long, so I'm not gonna talk anymore. <laughs> thank, thank you, Wesley. Uh, Beverly. I just wanted to um, mention that I watched the um, video of David Cycleback today of talking about his book against illiberalism. And I'm wondering if anybody else has seen that. It is just very, very good. Um, has anybody else seen that? Okay. Yeah, take a look at it. It helps. I've also explain. read the book. I also read the book. Okay. Yeah, read the book too, I'm sure. Thanks. Beverly, are, are you finished? Yeah, okay. Marie, hi. Hi, everyone. I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, um, 
what happened uh, in the 60s in relation to the Black Power movement. They, they didn't go away. Uh, they went underground, waiting for the opportunity to come back. And the, the, uh, and they have come back. Uh, a number of the people who were part of the Black Empowerment Movement are now considered the elders of blue. And uh, in fact, uh, I remember when um, Blue was given the, the $5. million, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, he's changed his name to um, an African name that I could never pronounce, but, I, but in any case, he was, he was on the stage and he mentioned that he found that they finally got what they didn't get uh, in the 60s. And the, the point is, the difference I see now is that the blue and drum are in much more control than the black empowerment movement were in the 60s. And I, and I think that that's what makes it so dangerous because they are controlling um, the ideas uh, of, you know, with the whole eight principle and, um, Everything else uh, that that we looked at, we're looking at, especially in reference to widening the circle of concern, it has um, blue and drum and the support white support group uh, hand all over it. And as long as people can be made to feel guilty about the original sin, they will continue to control them. And uh, I don't know what can be done about that, but I think, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, if Beverly wanted to talk about what happened to her at GA in relation to one of the leaders of Blue, I'm, you know, if she wanted to mention that, uh, I'll let her do that. But it just pointed out how the leaders can do just about anything and not be sanctioned. Thank you, Marie. Uh, John? I want to offer my note of hope and my note of hope up building on uh, Paul and building on Wes. Uh, in terms of Paul, if you do UUA statistics on the web, you'll, you'll see the gross numbers that are, are shown and those show RE down less than, you know, more than half from 1961 to 2020. And the the total number of members it shows, which I think is inflated, and Paul would probably agree with me, it shows almost a 1% rise from 61 to 2020. As Paul said, uh, that is that is uh, pretty small in proportion to a country that's about doubled in its population in that time. And, and the UUA numbers, again, shows congregations, many of which were maybe dead uh, and gone, as fewer than there were at, in 1961 and 2020, there were fewer congregations. But what really built the Unitarians before merger, didn't build Bumbo's Universalists, but built the Unitarians before merger was a fellowship movement, which really boomed in the, in the 1950s uh, uh, for the Unitarian Association. It started as a fluke. It started because there was a, uh, private at Fort Dix, New Jersey during World War II, who wrote the Unitarian Association, said, could you send me some sermons or, or some material uh, by mail? And they did. And then they start, you know, the Unitarians didn't think about this, but the private kind of started them off. And then from there, uh, they started the Church of the Larger Fellowship. My mother used to subscribe and get these things by mail out in a rural town with with no other Unitarians around. And then they started to see that at some places like Boulder, Colorado was the first, well, we got 10 or so people here, let's start something called a fellowship. And then they also had some people that they hired, Lon Ray Call and, and uh, Grant Butler being two of them, that would go out to some fellowships that were thinking about becoming churches and that were booming Obviously, some fellowships, 
just stay the same. Some of them disappeared. Uh, but uh, one of them ones that they went to, and I was there when Grant Butler came uh, for a three month interim. Uh, he would go uh, to three different churches in the three months, one, three months, the other, three months, the other. I guess he had some time in the summer that was off. And uh, he would help move them from being a fellowship to a church. That stuff ended uh, even before the Black empowerment. Uh, you know, in the early 60s, they stopped that. Now, my inspiration for you guys today is now we have Zoom. So we can not only have the one-to-one -one on Zoom, we can even get to, to Zoom groups, which we get 10 people like a fellowship, and we might grow from there. Uh, you know, the rest of you are, are, are willing to push on the UUA, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like the, the, uh, the uh, uh, whatever the animal is that sheds its skin and you know, and goes on. And uh, so I, 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 I'm inspired by the idea of the fellowship movement starting from that one to those small groups and seeing what we go, because, you know, what they're doing isn't working. And in terms, again, of uh, what uh, Paul's numbers were, uh, I would ask you this question. There were 25 members of the Chautauqua New York Church about 14 years ago, per the UUA directory. And they're now 170 now. Are you really impressed with that growth? Well, you know, they're not a year-round thing anymore. There are nine, nine lectures at rented space in Chautauqua, New York, and they have nine lectures during the summer months on different Sundays. And they pull in guest speakers, usually ministers. And, and so they got 170 members. Now, you know, what does that shrink to when you think about full-time? You know, well, maybe 20 or 25 or 32, uh, not very much, right? And that's part of the keeping the growth up is the 170 in Chautauqua, New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, John. I, I, I'm kind of winding down here. I'm, I'm out of gas. You know, it's been two hours. <laughs> is, is, it, is it okay if we stop? Yeah. Is that okay with people? Okay. Thank you for coming everybody thank you and thank, thank you all great. yes yeah, thank you Matthew treat. nice job all right thank you man good meeting first yeah my first time good. see you later okay all right. bye bye all right bye everybody bye 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 everybody thanks Richard you're ending uh, this I think he's coming gone. Fin okay, Finley bye. you'll bye. send us an email about the meeting Saturday okay Good night.